So we're going to start. Is everybody ready? Yes. Um, I've got a great panel now. Um, I'm just going to introduce very quickly because of, because of time issues. Um, Mary Lou Singleton, you know her. So honoured to have her here. She is the one that wrote it. Linda Pemberton, a white woman living in Florida, was in labor planning her home birth. 
A doctor disagreed with Pemberton's decision to give birth at home, and he had obtained a court order to perform a forced cesarean. Police officers were called. They arrived at Pemberton's home while she was in labor. They arrested her and strapped her legs together. They transported to her, to her to a hospital where she was cut open against her will. Pemberton later sued for violation of her civil rights, and the court ruled that the rights of the fetus out, outweighed the rights of Pemberton. Most women in the United States are unable to legally and affordably end unwanted pregnancies, even though we supposedly have legal abortions, very inaccessible for most women. Um, despite Supreme Court decisions giving protection to, do to doctors who perform abortions, very few medical providers are willing to do so, often out of fear of their lives. Eight physicians and many more clinic workers have been murdered by anti-abortion terrorists. Anti-woman forces are working full-time to eliminate access to abortion. In the past five years, over 300 new legal restrictions on abortions have been enacted in the United States. In addition to causing countless women to birth unwanted children, this is how the enormous increase in the number of women who are attempting self-abortion. Anna Yaga lives in Tennessee, a state where it's nearly impossible to obtain a legal, affordable abortion. She stabbed herself repeatedly in the vagina with a coat hanger in an attempt to end a 24-week pregnancy. She hemorrhaged and her boyfriend took her to a hospital where she delivered a 1.5-pound baby. Her, she was arrested for attempted murder and taken from the hospital to jail. Her boyfriend, who was present during the abortion attempt and who drove her to the hospital, was not permanently charged. Yaka remains in jail. So as you can see, Americans, American women's rights are in an absolutely dismal state. So what are the funded liberal institutions that say they're working to promote reproductive freedom doing about the situation? They are removing the word woman from the language of reproduction. They are promoting gender ideology and linguistically erasing the existence of sex-based oppression. Liberal feminist organizations are convincing the masses that female is nothing but an internal sense of identity and there is no such thing as biological sex. Some examples. Michelle Pacino Smith, birthing justice coordinator for Table Women United, created an image and slogan to promote birth sovereignty, which said midwifery is a woman's tradition. Leadership in the organization told her her language was exclusionary and transphobic. Pacino Smith lost her job with the organization. Joss Truitt, who is a male to trans activist and executive director, director of development and policy at Women in the made the following statement, stop saying and stop thinking that abortion is a women's issue. Folks, I'll be, we'll just be happy if we all stop thinking. Um, <laughs> the New York Abortion Access Fund removed the word woman from all language related to abortion. The Eastern Massachusetts Abortion Fund also erased the word woman from all of its literature. The fund's director of communication stated, the feminist movement has a long history of prioritizing the needs of cisgender women. If you stand for feminism and reproductive justice, you must demand equal access to abortion for all people, not just women. <laughs> At its 2014 convention, the National Organization of Women, or NOW, featured no sessions on abortion rights. The conference did, however, offer multiple sessions educating women about the ideology of gender identity and the need to center the men who say they are women in feminism. The conference ended with a resolution declaring, whereas, anytime now uses the term women or woman, it includes those who identify as women. In 2015, now issued this statement to its membership, instructing them on how to react to Bruce Jenner's transition. It's actually on the webpage telling now members what to do. It involves the words stunning and brave, and told members not to mention that Jenner looks prettier than themselves. Plan it's crazy. Planned Parenthood, the organization that gave us the workshops on breaking through the cotton ceiling, has also reversed, erased the word woman from the language of abortion, pregnancy, and birth. One employee said, we talk about having sexual and reproductive health services for everyone, including women who have penises, men who have vaginas. We have implemented non-gendered language by saying things like people with a uterus and uterus people. <laughs> so this is all very frustrating to those of us working to destroy male supremacy and liberate the class of people who are oppressed because of their biological sex. 
We used to have the words girls and women for these people who are smothered as babies because they have vulvas, sold to men as sex and breeding slaves under the misnomer child marriage, have their external genitalia removed in childhood, go to jail for suspicious miscarriages, and are forced to give birth against their wills. Now we're being told that using the words girls and women to describe the people oppressed on the basis of sex is hateful, exclusionary, and transphobic. Additionally, we're being told that biological sex doesn't even exist, and that identification with sex stereotypes is the only acceptable definition of male and female. Destroying the language that describes sex-based oppression robs us of our ability to name and fight sex-based oppression. But women are fighting back. This conference is an example of women refusing to be silenced. Yeah. And I want to give you a report back on some other actions of women refusing to be silenced as we are being written out of the language of birth. So as I mentioned before, where and how women give birth is an area of great political contention in the US. Major media outlets frequently public, publish editorials about whether or not women should be allowed to birth at home. Home birth midwifery is criminalized in 10 out of 50 states. And in the states where it's legal, it's heavily regulated in ways that prevent women from having autonomous choices. From the late 1800s through World War II, patriarchal medicine implemented a concerted effort to criminalize midwives and force all women to birth in hospitals. Birth became an industrial, interventive process for nearly all American women, and it remains largely so today. In the 1970s and late 1960s, a movement arose to reclaim sovereignty over birth. Women rebelled against degrading and over-medicalized birth practices and the modern home birth midwifery movement was born. As the movement to reclaim birth grew, the number of women-centered autonomous midwives grew. And in 1982, the Midwives Alliance of North America, or MANA, was created to be a home for the social movement of independent midwifery. MANA worked on a consensus model of decision-making, and because supporters of independent midwifery in the U.S. come from both the right and the left ends of the political spectrum, MANA consistently refused to take a stand on abortion rights. In 1999, several conservative board members blocked consensus on a proposal to align with the National Organization of Women to promote birthing justice. The conservative midwives were unwilling to work with the pro-abortion women's organization. Even though many right-wing midwives have left MANA over the past decades over issues such as including the care of lesbian women in the organization's ethics document, MANA still refuses to take a stand in promoting women's right to end unwanted pregnancies. The official position of the organization is that good people can disagree on abortion rights. I've been a member of MANA since 1995, and I served on the board of directors from 1997 to 1999. I considered MANA to be my ideological home as a midwife. MANA recognized midwifery not just as a profession, but as a social movement to liberate women from dehumanizing birth practices. Yeah, that's right. yeah. I trusted home birth midwives to retain an understanding of biology and the reality that feelings of gender identity aside, only female sex members of any mammalian species give birth. Yes. <laughs> From the 1980s through 2013, Mana promoted slogans such as a midwife for every mother. Midwife means with woman trust women, and believe in women, babies, birth, and midwives. In late 2014, however, the leadership of MANA decided to change the language of birth, choosing to prioritize gender identity over biology as the framework through which we should view human reproduction. MANA rewrote the core competencies for midwives document, and the words woman and mother were replaced with pregnant individual and birthing parents. This was not a change to the ethics document or a statement that midwives should be respectful of the beliefs and gender identities of the clients. This was not a separate guideline on the specialized midwifery needs of biological females with male gender identities who may have undergone mastectomies, testosterone therapy, and other medical procedures that very well could influence pregnancy and birth outcomes. This was a statement that feeling female is nothing but a feeling 
and that male people can give birth, and that all midwives must believe this if they are to be considered clinically competent. So, according to Mana, good people can disagree about whether or not women are state-regulated incubators, but all midwives must believe that men can give birth. Former Mana board member Michelle Pashino Smith and I worked with a group of midwives to draft an open letter to Mana expressing our concerns about the organization's move toward genderism. Here's an excerpt. We wholeheartedly endorse inclusivity, which above all requires midwives' provision of the particular care that transgender people need. Toward that end, we see the need to gather more information on the ways in which body modifications, puberty blockers, and long-term synthetic hormones may affect midwifery care in pregnancy and birth. Midwives are well aware of how body dysphoria can negatively impact pregnancy, birth, and breastfeeding. Before rushing into inclusivity, we need to focus on the clinical needs of transgender people and an open reflection of whether and how these particular needs fit into the scope of practice for midwives. Many concerned women and midwives signed on to the open letter. Signers included former MANA board members, the founder of Citizens for Midwifery, prominent indigenous midwifery leaders, and women at the forefront of the reproductive justice movement. We publicly released our letter in August of 2015. Within days, transgender activists started calling for blacklisting and silencing of women who had signed the letter. Trans activists campaigned to deplatform Henry Gaskin, former MANA president and the unofficially recognized mother of the modern home birth movement in the U.S. A pro-gender group of midwives and birth activists calling themselves birth for every body released a response to our statement. While claiming to address our concerns, they simply reiterated the queer theory claim that female is a state of mind and not a biological designation in a sexually dimorphic species. Michelle and I and the other signers are still waiting for a direct response from the Mana Board. The Board continues to refuse to discuss the issue with anyone who is not a gender enthusiast. Sarita Bennett, the Vice President of Mana, recently posted on Facebook that she was proud that Mana had effectively silenced any discussion of the issue. While the Board refused to formally respond to the open letter, they did communicate with my, Michelle and myself that we would not be allowed to have a table for the Women's Liberation Fund at the MANA conference because our presence would make people feel unsafe. Sarita <laughs> Bennett, the Vice President of MANA, left a message on my voice mail regarding Wolf's application for a table. She referenced that letter that you wrote. During the course of our correspondence, Bennett called my description of sex-based depression violent language. She told me that she knows from raising sons that patriarchy harms men as much as women. And she said that women who believe there's a global system of male supremacy are operating from a dys dysfunctional victim mindset. <laughs> so, in a time-honored tradition of band groups, we decided to hold a shadow conference in a hotel suite during the Manic Conference with the goal of educating midwives about radical feminism. <laughs> both members can vote. <laughs> we had both members come from around the country and we created a rad fan mini conference in a suite. The actual non-conference was very difficult for Michelle and myself and several other signers of the open letter. Now, this had been our home. Michelle and I both served on the board. These were our, our colleagues, our friends, our sisters, and midwifery. Mana used the venue to promote queer theory ideas about gender. Instead of the old slogans like midwife meets with woman and trust women, Mana distributed these buttons that said a midwife for everybody. Which I think of, you know, Mary, Mary Daly's talk about necrophiliac patriarchy and, and caring. Like when I think of bodies, I don't think of someone living inside of them. I think of a dead body. So no discussion was allowed about how this new saying is objectifying and reduces pregnant women to gender neutral bodies. Instead of caring for women, midwives now attend bodies. Wolf members were followed by mono organizers and security guards every time we entered the conference area. Our literature was confiscated and destroyed. When we attempted to have conversations about our concerns, we were told we were in violation of the conference's safe space policy. <laughs> These safe space signs were posted in every area of the conference. 
Most of the rooms had one. Um, the room where I gave my talk on herbalism for midwives had six. <laughs> Everyone, including one on the podium. <laughs> so uh, the Safe Space Science declared that people were expected to be welcoming to all, regardless of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, national origin, gender expression, language, and more. Notice which axis of oppression is missing from the Safe Space Science. <laughs> Our RADFEM suite served as a refuge and educational center for women interested in radical feminism. Mm. At least 100 women visited our suite during the course of the Lana event. We distributed free articles, stickers, and informational cards describing the difference between sex and gender and the importance of being able to name and fight sex-based oppression. We offered workshops, which were all well attended. This is Carol Downer. Um, she is 83 years old, a wolf member, and one of the founders of the women's self-help movement in the United States. And Carol's awesome. She's holding the Dellen menstrual extraction device <laughs> and explaining how she and her collective learned to do safe early abortions and how they helped assist over 10,000 women have safe abortions. <laughs> abortion was legal in the United States. And here she is describing to us how she went to jail for practicing medicine without a license for helping another woman put yogurt in her vagina to treat a yeast infection. And that's when Carol decided to go to law school. <laughs> Uh, Kathy Scarborough, who here is giving a talk on how women's liberation is based on sex, not gender. I talked about the growing commodification of women's bodies and the global market in human eggs, wombs, and breast milk. Laura Perez and Carol Downer led a cervical self-exam workshop. So this is a picture of the cervix of one of the participants that she took with her iPhone. You can see that. <laughs> the plastic speculum and the walls of the vagina, and then the lighter pink cervix, and then there's the opening of the cervix there. So as abortion rights disappear in the U.S., women need to know that their cervixes are only a couple inches away and they have a hole in them for easy access, and women who know this don't blindly stab themselves with coat hangers and other sharp objects. A group of us, including a detransitioning women, attended a horrible, horrible gender-promoting talk by Sam Killerman, who says he's the creator of this odious meme of the gender-bred person. Women mansplain to us how privileged we are as women and how we assist women and how we can't possibly understand the oppression experienced by trans women, such as feeling unsafe when walking down the street, <laughs> cat calls, and propositions from pimps and jobs. We were able to make many radical feminist comments during the question and answer period, but the overall take from the event was summed up well by Wolf member Sean Handel. Don't eat the gender bread, it made me really sick. <laughs> One of the most exciting outcomes of the Shadow Conference was the formation of a local Albuquerque wolf pack. There we are, howling. We've been meeting on a regular basis, hosting movies and other radical feminist events, and we hope to grow and recruit and change the world. Um, looking forward, we don't know if we're going to be able to turn this frightening tide. Will children in the 2020s be pushed even more strongly into conforming with gender? Asked at younger and younger ages if they want to be the Barbie or the army man kind of person. Will more and more women be forced to decide between the empowering choices of selling their eggs, being raped for money in brothels, or risking their health and lives as surrogates? Will Mana 2025 celebrate the progress of midwives removing babies from artificial wombs and handing them to their male to trans mothers? Or will people wake up from this nightmare and remember that biology, which is life itself, is sacred? That the class of people called women deserve honor, respect, and compensation for the reproductive labor only they can provide? And that beyond basic reproductive functions and anatomy, female and male people should be free to be human. <coughs>